So we'll start today's lecture, okay, and today's lecture is going to be about the carbon cycle. Um, so one of the things uh, we're going to be going through is basically explaining this graph and explaining why um, CO2 is rising through time and some of the details of these ups and downs. Um, so what this is actually showing you is that basically the measurements of CO2 in different places along the Earth through time. So we've got all of the, where all the measurements are happening, and you see sometimes the measurements are always made in the same place over and over and over again. So those are the Mauna Loa point in red and a place in the in Antarctica in, uh, in blue. But there are also lots of other measurements that are happening through time. Okay, so some, some, occasionally people might be measuring it in a city for a couple of years and then stop measuring it. Um, so the, the, those are the, 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 the grey points. Um, the light grey points, you can see they're a lot more noisy than the, uh, than the, the dark grey points, and that's because those are usually taken near cities where the concentration of the CO2 is a lot more variable because it's really near the source. And we'll see some of that a bit later on. Okay, so we're just going to be going through this, this whole slide. So just to, to recap what the last, because it was a while, a while ago, um, the last lecture that I did, which was the introduction to this biogeochemistry, was we went through all of these components of the climate system and described them in terms of what they're made of, Okay, what are the fluxes in, what are the fluxes out, why, why are they important? So, for instance, the lithosphere is important because that controls the supply of nutrients. It also, through weathering, controls atmospheric carbon dioxide and long time scales. The biosphere, we'll see today, is also very important for controlling atmospheric CO2. And then there was this concept of residence time, okay, which I've just gone through a little bit, kind of very quickly, just to show that, you know, how it's useful. Uh, but this is the concept of, basically, a long residence time means that it takes a long time to change the concentration in that reservoir, okay, or, or stock of, 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 what, of element or, or nutrient or, or whatever. Okay, and that's determined by the amount of stuff in it and the relative sizes of the fluxes in and out. Okay, so uh, today's, uh, today's lecture on biogeochemical cycles. Uh, we're going to be looking at the carbon cycle and we're going to be looking at what are the historical trends um, and trying to then put numbers on some of these fluxes and reservoir sizes to try and explain kind of some of the trends that we're seeing. Um, and we're going to be focusing on the land carbon cycle this time. So basically this is what we're kind of trying to explain. So this is the carbon dioxide concentration measured by um, actual measurements of the atmosphere in red and also from ice cores. So this is basically a, a, a not as good plot as the one that you've just, just seen. Um, and the, the thing is that, you know, back through geological time, kind of we've had some variation of carbon dioxide kind of within this, this, this band here. But the stuff that we're seeing at the moment, that's really, really unprecedented. So going back even further, the axis has flipped around here. Looking at carbon dioxide, it's gone through glacial, interglacial cycles, and that's been one of the, the real uh, controlling feedbacks on the orbital forcing of climate that's, that's determined then the magnitude of these glacial, interglacial cycles. Uh, but you can see here that the, the red line I've put on the edge, that's our anthropogenic carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and that's, that's way off the scale of this, of this bottom graph. The top one is, is a proxy for temperature. Um, looking over even longer time scales, you can see that there are potentially places in the past, so we're, we're over here now, and if you go back to maybe the Cretaceous, it was more CO2 in the atmosphere, but then again, much warmer as well. So, uh, but we're really going to be focusing in on the, um, this younger portion of the record for this, um, this uh, lecture. Okay, so... We're going to basically go through and describe what are the components of the carbon cycle in, in, the, in the terrestrial system uh, and what are the fluxes between them and how have we changed these fluxes and how is this, this seen in the, um, in, the, in the record of atmospheric carbon dioxide. Okay, so uh, I don't think you've got this particular version in your handout. So this is uh, a, a basically a cartoon of the carbon cycle um, from uh, 2007, uh, the last but one, uh, IPCC report, and I put this in just to, just to show that the, if you, the, the, the updated version, which is here, which is from 2013, which is still kind of, I guess, a little bit out of date. So some of these numbers have changed, and they've changed because we've put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Our anthropogenic activities, even over this short time from, 19, from 2007 to 2013, there, there has been an increase. But also we've, we've learned a little bit more about some of the details of the processes, for instance, in, in rivers, there are now all these extra arrows and fluxes because understanding um, the, uh, the, 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 the transport of carbon through kind of the terrestrial system, through rivers, it's not just once stuff gets in the river, it just gets washed out to sea. There are a lot of processes that go on in between there. 
Um, uh, just to get you kind of uh, clued in, I guess the, you've, unfortunately you've got um, a black and white uh, copy in your handouts, and that's because the power cut destroyed uh, the color printer. Um, but uh, the uh, red uh, arrows on here are uh, fluxes that have been changed by us, and the black ones are what's thought to be natural, uh, although it's quite hard to distinguish between the two. The stuff in the boxes, these are our stocks or reservoirs, so the amount of carbon in vegetation is this 450 to 650, so calling that maybe 550. Uh, the amount of carbon stirred in fossil fuels is in a box here. The amount in the ocean, and the ocean in this case split up between the surface and the deep ocean, and then also the biosphere in the ocean as well. Okay, but the important one really for climate is the top box, which is the amount in the atmosphere, and you can see that there are two numbers there. There's the 589, which is kind of the natural, and then there's the 240, which is the kind of uh, uh, the amount that we've added to the atmosphere uh, since pre-industrial times. Okay, so uh, just some more details of those stocks, okay, on the kind of forms that they're in. So this was covered much in the last lecture. Um, so the atmosphere is mostly made of gases, mostly CO2, but there are other forms of carbon there as well, methane and carbon monoxide. Uh, the land plant, the land biosphere, so that's mostly organic material, so in, in plants or in soils. Um, the oceans, we'll come on to next lecture, has got these uh, dissolved inorganic species make up most of the carbon. And then sedimentary rocks are made of calcium carbonate, but also organic carbon as well. So things like kerogen, oil, little bits of those are in, in quite a lot of sedimentary rocks. Okay, so uh, this is a simplified view of that, uh, of that, that's that, that um, carbon cycle or carbon system. So we've just here, just, just, just putting on the, the, some of the numbers for the amount of carbon in each of these um, stocks. So we can see that the amount of uh, carbon in the atmosphere is, is very, very small compared to the amount of carbon stored in the ocean. Okay, so the, the ocean really dominates the, the I guess, the available uh, to, um, uh, store of, of carbon. Uh, there's a similar amount of carbon in the atmosphere as there is in the terrestrial biosphere. Okay, um, and that's, yeah, but the, the atmosphere is, 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 is basically small, uh, but it is the one that's important because it's the one that is radiatively in, involved with climate. Um, so let's look at, now we're going to look at some of the, the transfers of these fluxes between the, the atmosphere and the biosphere. Uh, so I'm just going to just point out that for the moment I'm going to be ignoring the fluxes of, from volcanic emissions and from uh, rock weathering. So these are important on very long geological timescales, but the fluxes per year are actually very, very small. Okay, so they take a very long time to affect the climate Okay, whereas the, um, the fluxes in between the land plants and the atmosphere are much, much larger. Okay, so we have photosynthesis, brings down 120 gigatons of carbon per year, uh, which is huge. Um, but that, most of that comes straight back out because the plants are, are actively breathing. I think I've got that on the... No, I don't have that on the next slide. Anyway, uh, so they're, they're, they're actively breathing. Uh, you also have the decay of organic matter from soils, um, and that, that basically puts almost all of the carbon that's come out of the atmosphere from photosynthesis back into the atmosphere. So these fluxes between the atmosphere and the uh, terrestrial biosphere are very large, okay, but they're quite nearly in balance. Okay? Um, so we have also affected that balance a little bit. Okay? So the uh, deforestation, so we're chopping down trees, burning them to, you know, grow crops and uh, all kinds of nice things like beef and biofuels. Um, and that, that, that human activity, uh, that basically burning of terrestrial biomass, that's adding carbon to the atmosphere. And you can see that it's quite small compared to the other fluxes, okay, but there's no, there's no return. We're not actively... Uh, anthropogenically adding to the, the biosphere. Although we'll see later on that, that there are some things that are changing that are accounting for that or, or mitigating this, this deforestation uh, term. So this is basically a flux from the plants to the atmosphere that we are, we are adding to the, um, to, the, to the atmospheric pool. Um, and uh, so we can now think about some of these, some of these resonance times. Okay, so because the biosphere is uh, got maybe, I'm going to put 560 here, but say 550 uh, gigatons of carbon. Uh, but every year we're adding to that 
120 gigatons a year, which is quite large compared to the, 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 the flux, is large compared to the um, stock in the reservoir. So that means the residence time of carbon in the terrestrial biosphere is quite short. Okay? In soils, it's a little bit longer. But this means that we can, we can change the proportions of carbon in the atmosphere and the terrestrial biosphere quite easily, okay, because the residence time is quite short. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Some, some areas of the terrestrial biosphere, so rainforests are a bit longer, so it takes a lot longer for carbon to cycle through a rainforest than it does maybe um, grassland or something like that. But, um, but the, the key message here is that because the fluxes are large and the stocks are relatively small, we can... We can um, we can change the concentration or change the amount of carbon in each of those reservoirs very, very easily. Uh, and we can kind of see that in uh, the atmospheric record. Okay, so uh, those of you who have done the, the ELE practical on Excel, which is most of you now, um, you'll be familiar with this kind of sawtooth pattern in uh, atmospheric CO2. So it's going up, it's going down, it's going every year. Okay, so there's this overall trend uh, to higher concentrations but each year there's this big change, okay? And if you look closely at this graph, there's an, the, the black line is a record from Hawaii, which is in the northern hemisphere, and the gray line is a record from the South Pole, which is in the southern hemisphere. Uh, and you can see that they're anti-phased. So when uh, the northern hemisphere is high, the southern hemisphere is, is low, okay? So there's a seasonal effect of... of an, what we think, well, I think we're, we're pretty, pretty sure that, that, that this is the reflecting this transfer of carbon between the atmosphere and the terrestrial biosphere, okay, seasonally. So in the summer, when there's lots of um, photosynthesis going on, we get carbon moved out of the atmosphere and into the terrestrial biosphere, and in the winter, it gets released back out into the, into the atmosphere, okay? And that, that kind of fits with our observations that we're anti-phase between hemispheres, because summer is antiphase between the north and south. Um, also, um, uh, the, uh, the magnitude of these also hints towards that, and we'll see that basically in the northern hemisphere, there's more land, okay? So there's more terrestrial biosphere. So the magnitude of the fluxes in and out of the terrestrial biosphere are much larger in the northern hemisphere, okay? So that's, that explains why the, the, the black curve, the northern hemisphere curve, has got a bigger seasonal amplitude cycle. Okay. We, can we can have some, also some confidence that this is a photosynthesis signal, because if we look at oxygen concentrations, so the, the units in here are not the concentration in the atmosphere, because the concentration in the atmosphere is like 20%, but these are parts per million differences from that 20%. So very small changes in concentration of oxygen, but they do kind of match what we expect from the CO2 changes in that uh, when you look at them together, when we have a high period of... Uh, I'll just give myself a little pointer. Uh, pointer options. Okay, so when we have, a say, a high um, uh, CO2 in the northern hemisphere, okay, we look at the northern hemisphere record of, uh, in the red down here of oxygen, that's a low. So when CO2 goes up, oxygen's coming down. And that kind of fits with, with the photosynthesis versus respiration kind of argument. So that's that equation. It's not really an equation, but that kind of like summary um, uh, chemical balance for the photosynthesis reaction. So in, in the summer, we have higher rates of photosynthesis. So atmospheric CO2 is drawn down, okay? Um, and then in winter, just like at night, the plants still have to respire, okay? And also organic matter will be decaying in, 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 the, in the soil. That puts that CO2 back up into the... Um, into the um, atmosphere, okay? Um, and we have this difference between the north and south because um, most of the terrestrial biosphere is actually in temperate zones rather than the tropics, okay? So two-thirds versus a third. And there's more temperate land in the northern hemisphere. So I think, okay, so this is a, a kind of a, um, a seasonal animation of the flux of... Um, uh, uh, carbon from the atmosphere into plants. So this is gross primary productivity. So this is the amount that's being kind of stored by photosynthesis, ignoring the amount that's being released by respiration. But you can see that there's this kind of large bit of the northern hemisphere where we have uh, basically a large seasonal cycle. 
The tropics kind of do their own thing, there's not much change in the seasons, but in the southern hemisphere there's not much land, so we don't get this kind of pulsing that we see in the northern hemisphere. Okay, so that kind of explains why we have this, um, this sawtooth pattern between seasons and why the northern hemisphere has a bigger pattern. Um, okay, so to, to, to summarise the atmospheric um, uh, carbon cycle, then uh, you can see here that the, uh, the atmosphere has got, at the moment, 830 gigatons of carbon. Uh, most of that's CO2. Um, and the sources of that, the, uh, mostly the, the large fluxes are the, between the biosphere and the, uh, and the atmosphere. Okay? Um, uh, we do get this uh, switch between winter and summer, and that's what's explaining this sawtooth pattern. Uh, uh, so let's, let's, let's look at that a little bit more and look at actually <coughs> what we've done to, to change this. Okay? So, so we've already mentioned this deforestation flux, this 1.1 gigatons of carbon a year that we're adding to the atmosphere by chopping down trees and burning them. Uh, but we also have got this larger flux, um, 7.8 gigatons per year of carbon, which is us burning fossil fuels to give us heat, light, transportation. It's also us burning uh, limestone to make concrete. That's another significant source. But we add them all up. We put a bunch of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Okay? So if we look at these additional fluxes, if these are going into the atmosphere, 7.8 and um, 1.1, we should be getting about 9 gigatons of carbon per year extra in the atmosphere every year. Okay? So if you actually look at that, we, uh, we say, it's just this going through the math, so it's 7.8 and plus 1.1, we should get 9 gigatons of carbon a year, um, which is kind of an increase of 1 yeah. or 2% of the, the atmosphere concentration. Um, but if we actually look at how much has it actually increases by, it's a lot less than that. So we only are looking at, every year, the atmospheric carbon dioxide reservoir goes up about 4 gigatons of carbon a year. So we're adding 9 to the atmosphere, but it's only going up 4 every year. So something's a bit off. Um, so we've basically got to think about what are these um, alternate fluxes. Okay? So we can, we can actually measure some, some fluxes in, into and out of the ocean, because okay? it's actually quite easy to measure the amount of carbon in the ocean. Uh, you just go there and measure the, the, the carbon species in the ocean and you can see how those have changed. Um, and it does look like some of that carbon that's in the atmosphere, like some, some of this 9 gigatons of carbon a year, so it looks like some of that is going into the ocean, okay? but it's only about 2, okay? 2.3 here. Okay? So uh, that does explain some of the difference, okay? but it doesn't explain all of the difference. Okay, so we're still missing some carbon. Okay, so we've put loads in the atmosphere, nine. We can measure that it's going up every year, uh, 4.3. Um, so that creates a difference of kind of 4.7-ish. Um, uh, and this number here doesn't explain it all. Okay, so just to, just to, just to you know, make it like super ridiculously obvious, uh, uh, 7.8 plus 1.1 does not equal 4.3 plus 2.3. Okay, so we've got this, there must, be, there must be this other term here, okay? We're missing, we're missing a source. Um, and the only place for that to go, okay, is into the terrestrial biosphere. Okay, so uh, just by summing up what we know and not making any measurements at all of the terrestrial biosphere, we've gone, it must be in the terrestrial biosphere. So that's even though we're chopping down a bunch of trees, okay, turning them into farmland, we're destroying soils, we're putting this, so we're basically, every year we make the terrestrial biosphere a bit smaller, even though we do that, it's still accumulating carbon. Okay? And we can actually, rather than just you know, use maths to, um, to that, we can actually go and look at some measurements. So this is uh, part of a project which I think some of the uh, ecology staff uh, here in Edinburgh are, are working towards, uh, and this is looking at the Arctic, so this is north, uh, northern North America, so Canada and, and um, Alaska, um, and what they're doing, they're using satellite measurements of effectively how green the Arctic is, okay? 
Um, and between uh, the 80s and like the early 2000s, uh, you can see that basically it's got more green. So the, the, the two images at the top there are the uh, kind of before and after, and this is a, a difference plot. Um, so this means that there's basically more photosynthetic activity okay, going on in the Arctic. Okay? And this is, this, these, these studies are also replicated with kind of, uh, kind of field scale plots where people actually go out and measure individual plants. Uh, people have done this in, in the tropical rainforest as well, so there are researchers uh, here doing that as well. And it seems that uh, while we are chopping down and burning trees and stuff, the, the, the biosphere that's left is becoming more and more efficient at taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Okay, so it's becoming more photosynthetic photosynthetically effective or efficient. And that kind of does at least make sense um, uh, from a physiological point of view. So photosynthesis is a chemical reaction, okay, which goes faster when it's warmer. Okay, so if it warms up, we'll have more, the rates of reaction will go up. And also, we've been increasing the atmospheric concentration of CO2, and at least C3 plants, uh, which should concentrate the carbon out of the atmosphere into their, into their cells in a less sophisticated way than C4 plants. But the, those, if you give them more CO2, that's one of the things that they need for photosynthesis. So if the atmospheric concentration goes up, they'll be able to do more photosynthesis. Okay? So we can look at this balance between... Um, uh, basically the, what we know we've put into the atmosphere through either deforestation or burning fossil fuels. Um, and we can balance basically what we know that the concentration in the atmosphere has been. We know where, what's gone into the ocean. And we can see that what's left behind must be the uh, terrestrial biosphere, which is this green band here. So we can see that through time, okay, as we've increased our carbon dioxide concentration, this kind of store in the, or rate of putting stuff in the terrestrial biosphere, that's increased through time. Okay, so this is supporting the, the line of evidence that the increase in the terrestrial biosphere is a response of the increasing atmospheric CO2. Okay, so can we see any more evidence for that? Okay, so one line of evidence might be if the, if the biosphere is becoming more active, okay, if it's able to become more efficient, we might expect the magnitude of this seasonal cycle, okay, between summer and winter, to be larger, okay, because if it's getting warmer, because it, and therefore there's doing like more photosynthesis or there's more CO2, that mean it, then we might be uptaking more each year and then giving back more. So the size of this um, this this amplitude might change. So it doesn't look like just from eyeballing it that that this magnitude is any different to the magnitude up here in the 80s. Um, but actually, when we go and dig down for the data, so uh, this, is, um, this is just a, a plot from the, the data that you guys used in the practical, just to demonstrate that there is this seasonal cycle in CO2, in orange at the top there. Uh, and just as a heads up for maybe the next lecture, you can see also that there appears to be a seasonal cycle not as well defined in ocean pH as well. So this is just a bit of a teaser for, for next lecture, because I know how you like to be you know, informed about what's coming up. Um, but if you look at the magnitude of that cycle, okay, through time, um, then it appears that in maybe the 60s and 70s, the size of that annual cycle was a little bit smaller than it is now in the, well, I guess in the 90s and whatnot, okay? So I didn't, I didn't re when I saw this graph, I didn't think that this was very convincing. I couldn't find the data for it, so I did it myself using the data from uh, the practical. Um, and you can see that, so I've just plotted up the, basically the difference between the maximum summer temperature, the summer, sorry, the maximum, the, sorry, the minimum summer CO2 and the uh, maximum winter CO2 for each year. So I just plotted those up for each year. So this is basically the size of the seasonal cycle. And you can see that there is quite a lot of scatter in that plot. Uh, but if you do a regression through that, you do get a positive gradient. So it is increasing through time. Uh, and then you can also look at the uncertainty of that regression, okay, using some of the, the functions that are given in the, uh, the Excel tutorial. And we can see that that, that uncertainty, that basically that, that slope of the line, the uncertainty in that slope of the line does not overlap with zero, okay, which does suggest that this is a real change through time. 
So the biosphere is becoming more active. We, do, we are seeing a small change in the seasonal amplitude of the CO2 in the atmosphere, which is a, basically a flag telling us that it's actually the terrestrial biosphere is becoming more active, okay? which does therefore explain where this missing CO2 has gone. So one of the big questions that um, I guess we have as climate scientists going into the future is what will happen to that terrestrial store of carbon dioxide, okay? Will, it, will the terrestrial biosphere continue to become more and more and more efficient as the CO2 concentration goes up and up and up and the temperature goes up and up and up? Or will we reach some point where it can no longer kind of increase its capacity to store carbon? And that might be because we can come up to some limits of water, okay, if, it, if, we, if these regions become too arid and some regions will become arid, some will become wetter, so that's not, not very sure. Uh, it might be that the, the rates of productivity, the, the amounts of biological activity might be limited by something else than light and, and the availability of carbon dioxide. So we might see in the next couple of lectures that elements like nitrogen and phosphorus might become limiting. And if we limit the ability of the plants to grow, that means that this, this additional flux of carbon out of the atmosphere into the terrestrial biosphere will become less efficient. And if that becomes less efficient, then when we put carbon into the atmosphere, it won't come out as fast. Okay, so this will be a big problem. Okay, um, so there's also um, just, a, just a another line of evidence that if you, if you pump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, okay, in this case people are actively pumping carbon dioxide into a greenhouse in California. Um, this is done all over the kind of the developed world. Uh, we pump our, we basically burn fossil fuels and pump them into greenhouses to make plants grow faster. Okay, so this is a really well understood mechanism of, um, of using carbon dioxide to effectively fertilise plant growth. And this is what's happening in the atmosphere as a, as a, as a whole with the this work here. So um, I thought I'd just show uh, this map uh, animation of carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere to demonstrate this seasonal cycle. Okay, so you can see that most of the... The, the sources of carbon dioxide are in the northern hemisphere, kind of industrial areas. Here's China, Europe's kind of pretty bad. Uh, east coast of North America, it's pretty, pretty awful as well. Um, you can see this, this kind of this pulsing going on over the Amazon. Okay, that's the day-night cycle in um, photosynthesis respiration. Um, and you can see we're in winter now, and you can see the northern hemisphere is giving out a lot more carbon dioxide now. Okay, and that's because the plants there, I mean, it's dark, it's cold. Uh, there's not a lot of photosynthesis going on at all, really. I mean, you still kind of, um, you, see, you see this pulsing going on in the, in the tropics, which is the day-night cycle. You can't really see that in the northern hemisphere at all. Uh, and importantly, in the southern hemisphere, carbon dioxide concentrations are very low, and that's because it's summer there, so the plants are all drawing it out of the atmosphere. But also, there's not a lot of land there. So if I just... Uh, uh, how do I get rid of my little pointer? Uh, so if I just zoom forward a little bit in the video, so this is now fully in summer. Okay, so you can see now that the northern hemisphere has now got a very, very low carbon dioxide concentration. That's because the biosphere there is being really, really active. You can see, still see the industrial sources in China, uh, a little bit less in Europe because we've exported all of our industry to China. Um, <laughs> Uh, oh, it's true. I mean, you've got an apple. Yeah, you go, where do you think that was made? Um, anyway, uh, but you can see now the, the southern hemisphere is starting to give out a little bit more um, uh, CO2 because it's, it's winter there. Okay? So you can see the, 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 basically the day-night cycle in photosynthesis versus respiration in the, the, the pulsing. But you can also see the interhemispheric seasonal cycle in CO2 versus this kind of like... Uh, respiration in the northern hemisphere as so we're coming back into, into winter now and you can see it all kicking off in a big way. Okay? So you can see the atmosphere is also kind of like not completely well mixed. Okay? So it does take uh, a couple of years or so to completely mix the atmosphere which is why we're able to have this difference between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. If the atmosphere was totally well mixed it, we wouldn't see any variation at all. Um, uh, yeah. And let's, let's, let's finish that one there. And that was from NASA, which is was, which was nice of them. Um, okay, so, um, so the next 
Next thing to, that we're going to be talking about, which will be uh, in the next lecture, and I'll just give a little bit of an introduction to in this lecture, is the uh, ocean carbon cycle. So this is looking at these fluxes into and out of the ocean, which are currently taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and into the ocean, and then how, what happens to carbon when it, when it enters the ocean, how, it, how its chemistry behaves, and how it gets kind of moved between the surface and the deep ocean. Okay, because this is important because only the surface ocean interacts with the atmosphere. Um, okay, uh, so just to summarise the land, kind of, uh, so we went and showed you some historical trends uh, and showed you where the carbon was, atmosphere and in the terrestrial biosphere, and showed you these kind of fluxes between the two. And that because the residence times are short, it means that changing the fluxes between the atmosphere and the ocean, or the atmosphere and the terrestrial biosphere, can force these changes. So it means that the atmospheric carbon dioxide can change through time, okay? So we do see a trend through time. But also we can see some of these seasonal variations which are showing us some of the processes which allow us to identify these kind of missing sinks, okay? Um, okay, so one of these, these sinks that we actually know quite well is the ocean. Okay, so we're actually taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, so that should say 8.30 at the top, so I haven't really updated these, this slide since last year, but uh, hey-ho. Um, but once we get carbon out of the atmosphere, it gets into the ocean, it doesn't, it's, just not, it's not just one beaker uh, with water and, and carbon. Okay, we can split it into different kind of stores of carbon. So in the surface ocean... Most of the carbon is uh, dissolved inorganic carbon, so just CO2 dissolves in water, okay, and then it reacts to form some chemical species, bicarbonate and carbonate ions. Um, but some of the carbon kind of gets incorporated into um, animals, uh, plants, things like that. So uh, plankton, photosynth well, photosynth photosynthetic plankton, take some of the carbon dioxide from the water turn that into organic matter, that works its way up the food chain. Uh, there's also other reactions that happen with things that precipitate calcium carbonate shells, uh, and that means that there's, there can be a flux from the surface ocean to the deep ocean, okay? And that because particles of biology, so mostly fish poo, that sinks down for the ocean, okay? And it sinks down, breaks apart, and releases its carbon uh, into the deep ocean. Okay, so that's one important flux. Uh, another one is we actually do get mixing between these two layers in the ocean. So if the concentrations of carbon are different between those two layers and we just mix them physically, then um, there will be a flux of carbon across that boundary. Um, yeah, so to, just, to, just to quickly explain the, the, the different species. So um, we have the species dissolved in organic carbon. Okay, so that's this chemical here mostly. Uh, bicarbonate, HCO3 uh, minus, uh, but there's also carbonate iron, which is CO3 2 minus, and also dissolved CO2. But the, this, this one is the most abundant. Um, we have, and then we have stuff that is kind of organic, okay, at all levels of the, the food web, as it were. Okay, so one of the, the most important concepts that we need to, to understand is actually the exchange of the CO2 between the atmosphere and the ocean, okay? So of all of the chemical species in the ocean, only CO2, well, there are some really, really minor components, but only CO2 is a gas, okay? So it's only the form, the chemical form that's carbon dioxide that can exchange with the atmosphere. So this exchange can be described by this uh, chemical kind of relationship called Henry's Law, after somebody called Henry, um, I think it was his second name. Uh, and basically what Henry's law says is that if you've got some gas, okay, in a container with some liquid in it, okay, the gas will basically, some of the gas will dissolve in the liquid and some of it will stay not dissolved. And that, and that, that exchange between the uh, gaseous phase and the dissolved phase uh, can be described by a solubility constant, okay? So it's quite, it's quite odd that it's called a solubility constant because we'll see in a bit that it's not constant. But all it basically is describing is basically the, the, the dissolved concentration 
Okay? So how many grams per litre of CO2 will dissolve is dependent on the partial pressure of the gas. So this is the, basically the concentration of gas times the pressure of the atmosphere. Okay, so, uh, so you, can, you can reduce the partial pressure by lowering the concentration of gas, also, also by just lowering the pressure, um, uh, times this solubility constant. And that con constant is different for different gases, okay? But it also changes with some environmental parameters as well. Uh, okay, so just, this is just an example. So at, at, at 25 degrees Celsius, one atmosphere, we can get 1.5 grams per litre of CO2 in, in, into, um, uh, into water. Okay, and other gases are different. So nitrogen is a lot less soluble. That's because carbon dioxide is a little bit of a polar molecule can dissolve in water. Um, so this is, this is a graph showing that solubility constant at different temperatures. Okay, so at, at high temperatures, CO2 is less soluble than it is at low temperatures. So this means that at, when it, the temperature is low, okay, when it's cold, you can store more gas in the liquid compared to the atmosphere. Okay, so this, if you get a can of, uh, can of Coke or, you know, non-soft beverage that you might have, and you put it in the fridge and for a long time, make it very cold, and you open it, and it'll go pssst, right? And if, but if you take it out of the fridge, leave it on the radiator for a while, and then open it, it'll fizz up everywhere, because the gas can't be dissolved in the liquid, whereas at low temperatures, it can. So this is, this is, um, uh, this is really important, because this means that when the climate is very cold, in, say, a glacial, okay, that means that the ocean can dissolve more carbon dioxide in it. So if you warm up that ocean, okay, the gas that's dissolved in the water doesn't like being dissolved in the water anymore. Okay? So when it reaches the surface, when it gets in contact with the atmosphere, CO2 will come out of the ocean into the atmosphere. Okay? So this is one of the, uh, I guess, these. Uh, it's, it's sometimes called the solubility pump. So basically when the ocean gets cold, it can pump carbon out of the atmosphere into the ocean. And this is also thought to be a strong feedback on glacial, interglacial temperature control. Because when glacials, it's cold, the oceans can store more CO2 as they warm up. They can't hold that CO2, it goes into the atmosphere, and the planet warms even more. Okay, so that's this kind of, uh, this, this exchange between the atmosphere and the, and the ocean, and it's basically a, f a function of the partial pressure, how much you can get in the gas of, in the ocean is how much is in the atmosphere and the temperature. The salinity is a small control as well, but those are the, the main two. So if we look at maps here, uh, we can see that we're now, these are maps of the flux of carbon from the atmosphere, uh, uh, no, from the ocean to the atmosphere. Okay, I think, uh, yeah. So this is looking at, uh, in the cold bits of the oceans around the poles, uh, we can see that there's a negative flux, so this is carbon coming from the atmosphere into the ocean, whereas in warm places, okay, the water can't hold that carbon anymore because it's too warm, so when it gets to the surface, it goes from the ocean into the atmosphere. So those are, I think, these type of places here. Okay, so, so understanding how these patches of cold and warm water will change in the future, and also what their carbon concentrations are when they get to the surface, okay, this is going to be an important part of predicting kind of how that flux from the atmosphere to the ocean will change through time, okay, because if we make the ocean warmer, it's going to be harder for this CO2 that we're currently putting in the atmosphere to get into the ocean, so that, that 2.3 gigatons of carbon per year, if the oceans get warmer, that flux will not be able to keep up as much, okay, which is disappointing. Um, okay, so that's, uh, that's the end of today's uh, lecture uh, for today. Uh, so we're doing more about the ocean tomorrow, uh, which will be fun. Okie dokie.